It is good to be here this morning. And uh, for those who don't know who I am, I'm Pastor Austin. My name's actually not Pastor, it's Austin. I just happen to be a pastor, and they like to put that in front of my name. So I'm Austin, and I'm one of the pastors here. And I deal with college-age students, 18 to 23. So if you're 18 to 23 or know someone, I'd like to get to know you. And tonight at 7.30, we've got a mac and cheese bar happening for the college students. So I know there's some people that are looking really sad that you're not 23 years old or 20 years old. But we cooked a ton of bacon at my house yesterday for the toppings, Um, and so my house smells like heaven, and it's great, Um, and and the Lord is good. So we are in the series 1 Corinthians, and if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to chapter 3. That's where our text will be today. Now, last week was Easter, and uh, as usual, you know, most people take like a family picture on Easter. How many, raise your hands, took like a family picture, you get dressed up with the kids and everything, and you get a picture. And so I always take an opportunity to brag on my wife and my kids. And so here's our family Easter picture last week. This was at my uh, parents' house for lunch, and it was a good day. Sam is my son. He's uh, a little over four years old. He turned four back in December. Paisley's our middle child who I'm holding, and she's a little over two. She's about two and a half now. And uh, Essie is 11 months, and yesterday um, she's just been growing so much the last like week. It all happens at once. She started climbing up the stairs. She had never done that, and she went up our entire flight of stairs, and we're like, where'd she go? And she's, she's, she's up. And so uh, don't call like, we're good parents. I mean, we were there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good. So um, looking at this picture, I know what you're thinking. Just, man, how good looking am I? You know, that's just, just great. But, but sometimes we tend to look at pictures And this isn't really a part of my my sermon, but we we tend to look at a picture and we forget that that picture was taken in like a millisecond of reality. And and we see the good picture of Easter, but you don't see the meltdown or you don't see what I don't want you to see. And I wonder what our lives and how our lives would change if we were to stop comparing millisecond pictures and moments and times And remember that we all have moments that we're not proud of. And we all have moments that we don't want to highlight. And I wonder if the the quality of our life would improve if we spent a little less time comparing our lives and comparing our relationships and our children with each other and we started comparing our lives to that of Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you, um, you know, as, as you entertain social media, as you have different avenues. Let's, let's keep the main thing the main thing, Jesus Christ, and let's not compare and nitpick so much. Amen? All right. As I said, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to be reading. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together. I pray that your spirit would flow through me, it would speak to me, it would speak through me, God, and and uh, that, that you'd open up ears, you'd open up eyes, you'd open up hearts for what your word has to say, God. I pray that a specific message for each individual here in this room would be heard from your spirit, God, and that you would fill us and equip us with your power and your might to do whatever you're calling us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continue standing as we read. Starting in verse 1. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly Mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes this grow, things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. I want to stop and just explain a little bit what's happening here. Paul boasts about himself and Apollos as being like servants. He's essentially saying, I am nothing. I'm a nobody. I am but dust, a one T but dust. 
if you want to brag in me, just remember that I consider myself to be a slave, a servant, a nobody. You see, the Corinthians would never um, have uh, likened themselves to being like a, a farmer. They would never have likened themselves to have stooped as low to be a farmhand, to work in, in agriculture and, and those things. They were very proudful and, and, and full of pride. And so Jesus is speaking to their pride, or Paul is speaking to their pride and saying, look, you're boasting in me, but I consider myself a slave. I'm a nobody. He understood his place in the kingdom of God, and he's speaking to the Corinthians who were very proud. We read on in, in verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on the foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. You may be seated. See, Paul goes on and after talking about and likening himself and Apollos to being like farmers, like, like slaves, like servant hands, he, he now calls himself a wise builder and he talks about how many others uh, also build. And he talks about the different materials that, that people are building with and how there's a test of, of the quality of what we're building. And, and you might be a little bit um, confused or just, what, what is Paul building? And so I just want to bring some clarity to that this morning. And the first thing that you need to know is that people make up the temple of God. Verse 16 says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? The word you in the Greek is a plural. And so it's saying, don't you know that you all, or in Texan, y'all are the temple of God, right? You all, meaning the church of Corinth, meaning anybody who believes and calls on the name of the Lord, you are the temple of God. You all carry his presence. See, Paul understood something very significant that no longer did people encounter God in a physical place, but people encounter God in a temple that is, is mobile, that's, that's a part of his body. You see, 15 years approximately after this letter was written, in 70 AD, the physical temple was destroyed. And, and the temple was a place where people would go in and encounter God. The temple was, was crafted with just the best um, design possible. It, it was masterfully and wonderfully, it was so beautiful, people would, would walk in and they would see God's beauty. People would walk in and have this encounter with God. And, and Paul is understanding this and, and, and speaking to this. No, it's no longer in a physical place. It's in you. It's in the people. It's in the Corinthians. It's in New Hope. It lives inside you. And, and when they gathered great things happened. And when they gathered, the, the presence of God, it manifested. And, and when it, they gathered, the lame were healed and people were saved. People were being added to their number daily because they understood that the Spirit of God resided inside them. And I ask you this this morning, why is that not happening now? Why are we not seeing miracles every week? Why is there not people being saved every single day? Why are there empty pews? Could it be that we are really good fakers? Could it be that when we gather at church and we gather in our Sunday school classes and we gather in our small groups, that could it be that we look like the temple of God? That, that we act like the temple of God, but we have allowed so much moral filth and so much sin into our lives that it has smothered out the Spirit of God, which is supposed to be an all-consuming fire. Could it be that we're really good fakers? In high school, I went over to a friend's house, and, and, and this friend, his dad, rolled around like a big shot. He drove a really nice car. 
I knew they had a big home. Their kids always wore the nicest clothes. And so I was pretty excited to go over to this house. I'm like, oh, this is going to be sweet. You know, they're going to have everything, snacks galore. I remember walking up to this home, an all-brick home, and, and it was probably about a 4,500-square-foot home. And, and I, uh, I, I wouldn't have known that at age 16, but now knowing and having bought a home, I, I know square footages or could guess, right? So I'm walking up to this home. I walk through the front door. I see these hardwoods, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I walk through the kitchen, and then I walk through the living room, and then we go upstairs to the kid's bedroom, and I walk past the dad's room and the sibling's room, and we go downstairs— and there's no furniture anywhere. The beds are literally on the ground, no box spring. There's no dresser for their clothes. All their clothes are piled up on the, the, the ground. Down in the basement, there's a flat screen TV leaned up against the wall, not mounted, not on an entertainment system, nothing, just laid up against the, the wall. And there's a, a giant bean bag where people could watch. The, the kitchen table and chairs did not match the finishings or the furnishings of of the house. I opened up the refrigerator. There was next to nothing in there. And I remember at 16 years old thinking to myself, this guy has no money. It's all a facade. He just wants people to think that he's well off and that he's successful. Now, I'm not accusing anyone here this morning of putting on a facade, but I want to ask you a very serious and a sobering question. Do you just look like the temple of God? Or have you built your life in such a way that the very tangible presence that can be felt and that can be seen, the very tangible presence of God goes with you everywhere that you go? It follows you into your workplace. It follows you into your home. It follows you into your parenting. It follows you into your relationships and your marriage. Have, have you built your life where God's presence is with you all the time, or do you just look like a temple? Do your coworkers even know where you stand with Christ? Can they sense it? Can they feel it? Some of you have been to some very dark places in this world. If you've been on a, a mission field or you've been out of the country or uh, there's places here in Des Moines and you can feel the physical darkness. You can walk in and think, oh, that's, that's not right. Can people feel God when they walk next to you? Can they feel that light burden, that easy yoke? Can they feel that? Are people encountering Christ through you in the same way that people encountered Christ through the physical building when that's where the Spirit of God resided? In a world that is fed up with fakes and phonies, let me encourage you, church, to become the real thing. Parents, your kids can sniff out a fake. The Christian deeds that you do, do you do them out of obligation? Do you do them because that's what Christians do? Do you do them because that's how your parents raised you? Do you do them because that's what the pastor told you to do? Or do you do them because Jesus Christ has entered your heart, he's birthed in you a desire to do those things? You see, one is fake, one is manipulated, and one is real. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. May I be like you. Change my heart from the inside out. I need a heart transplant because my heart in and of itself is evil and it's wicked. But Jesus' heart is alive and pure and I need a heart transplant this morning so that I'm not producing fake fruit, so that I don't just look like the temple of God, but so that I am the temple of God, so that God's spirit goes with me. There's power in that. See, for a long time, I used to think that if you just changed your surroundings, and I've even preached this, and I'm so ashamed. If you just just change your surroundings and watch your influences, that you'll sin less. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, you'll probably sin less when the opportunity is not there. Great, good job. But you know what that is? That's temporal, and it's nearsighted to a problem that will be with us the rest of our life. For those who didn't know, my wife Elizabeth was the early childhood pastor here for about six and a half years, and I married her for a multiple, uh, a multitude of of reasons, but one of them was so that she could finish raising me, and two, that she could tell me, I'm serious, I'm serious, and two, so that she could tell me how to raise my kids, because I would have had no idea what to do parenting, and I've learned a lot. 
I really have. And Elizabeth, I'm so thankful for you. I, I really am. I, one of the things that she has taught me is to parent the real need, not just correct the behavior. To parent the real need, to look past the behavior and see the need. And to parent that, not just correct the behavior. Let me explain. Every night when I tuck my kids into bed after we pray, the last thing that I tell all of my kids is, Daddy loves you, but Jesus loves you the most. Close your eyes and say your prayers, because Jesus is the most important person that you can talk to. And Sam and Paisley, Essie, You need to ask Jesus into your heart to change your heart. That way you can love your sister. That way you can love your brother. And and you need him to come into your heart and change your heart so that you can obey your mom and your dad and to be kind to your classmates and your schoolmates. You see, if I were just to raise a really well-behaved kid and, and just teach them how to behave well, I'm raising a fake. I'm raising a phony because their heart hasn't been changed. They've just learned how to mask their evil heart. What my kids need and what I'm trying my best and I need God's grace every day to explain to my kids is that, kids, you need Jesus to come into your heart so that you can, you can do the things that he's called you to do. They need a heart change. And if all I do is correct their behavior, their heart is still wicked and evil and selfish and mean. Some of you this morning are exhausted because your works are not flowing from a transformed heart, but a manipulated or obligated heart. Jesus Christ wants to free you from that spirit of religion. That way you can genuinely carry the presence of God with you to your home, in your workplace, your neighborhood, to the ends of the earth. And at the end of the service, I'm going to call those who are standing with me saying, I need more of God's presence. I need more of God's power. I need a refreshing of his spirit to fill me and equip me so that I can do what he has called me to do. I want it to be real fruit. I don't want it to be fake fruit. I don't want to be doing it because I want to make my pastor proud or my, my spouse proud or anything else. I want it because Jesus Christ wants it for me and if that's you at the end of this service I'm going to call you forward and we are going to pray and you're going to pray and it's going to be your prayer and your moment and then we're going to sing a song build my life at the bridge and the chorus of saying I will build my life on the firm foundation the foundation of love of Jesus Christ and and so I want you to be ready at the end to step forward and join me in saying and declaring we are God's people and we will build God's kingdom See, people are the temple, and the second thing that I want you to see is found in verse 8, where Paul says, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. Circle one purpose. Underline one purpose in your Bible. In verse 10, Paul refers to other people as being builders and how we should build with care. What is this shared purpose? What are we building? People are building the temple. In other words, people are are building people. How many know that working, when working towards one purpose, whether it's building a house, a church, a giant boat, you know, whatever the one purpose is, that you are dependent upon the work done before you, and you're dependent upon the work after you, right? And and so how many have done some, you know, construction to consider yourself a handyman, right? Okay, not many. That's kind of sad. Um, if, if a framers are going to come in and frame a house, and things aren't on center, things aren't level, things, things are off, you know who gets to deal with that later? The sheet rockers, right? The people throwing in the sheet rock, and they're going to be ticked, and they're going to be picking up all sorts of slack that wasn't done, and then, and then guess who gets to, to, to deal with it again? The, the trim carpenters and the finishers, and you see this sloppy job done in the framework only compounds and problems later on. We can't have this section over here building with gold, and this with costly stones, but then this section over here building with straw. Because you can't lay a gold brick on top of a straw wall. It doesn't work that way. We all have one purpose. We are all in this together. I don't need to do the song and dance again. Listen. There are times when you plant and I water. And there are times when I water and you plant. And there are times when I finish the work that you started, and there'll be times when you finish the the work that I started. 
We are dependent upon each other, and you as a follower of Jesus Christ have a responsibility and an obligation and a duty to build other people. And for your entire life, you're going to receive lies from Satan. I'm not qualified. I'm not smart enough. I'm not holy enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not whatever enough. You know what? Jesus doesn't speak to those excuses and say, oh, you're excused. You're okay. Jesus speaks to that and says, I will equip you, and you are to do what I ask you to do. He's calling you. He's commanding you. His last words on earth, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, you guys know it. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, of all people, preaching and teaching. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Listen, I can't sharpen every single one of you. Do you know how exhausting that would be? I, I, I only have so many lunch appointments. I only have so many breakfasts. I only have so much time that I can talk on the phone. I only have so many small groups that I can go to. You look to your left, you look to your right, there's your brother. Say, hey, come on, man, we're going to do this. We're going to be godly parents. There's your sister. Say, you know what, you're down, let me pick you up. You know what, I'll be down next week, you can pick me up. We need to start being the church. We need to start building each other. Parents, I'm calling you guys to a higher level this morning. Dad's in the room. Did you know that your involvement and attendance to church is exponentially more important than the mom's? Promise Keepers put out a study a few years ago about the impact the dad has on attending and, and being involved in church, and they mirror a study that Barna Group did in a book called You Lost Me about reaching uh, the lost millennials. And it, the studies said this, that dads that attend regularly and are involved regularly, regardless of a mom's attendance, 66 to 72 percent of those children will become regular attenders. If a mom attends regular, but the dad does not, between 10 and 14 percent of those children will become regular attenders. Another study said that if a kid gets saved first in their household, that there's a 3.5 percent probability that the rest of the family will follow suit and all be saved. If a mother's the first one to be saved in the family, this study says that there's a 17 percent chance that the rest of the family would be saved. But if the father, if the dad, if the man in the household gets saved first, this is, this is crazy, 93%. I think that a lot of problems in the church, in the world, in our schools, in society, stem from a lack of male leadership. And I'm not talking about domineering, I'm not talking about you know, just overriding your wife. I'm talking about in a spiritual role, and I think there are a lot of absent fathers. And I'm not talking about absency in, in the sense that, um, well, I'm just completely out of the home. You know, it's divorce situation. It's, it's um, you know, single mom, whatever, whatever it, it is. What I'm talking about, and I'll be the first to admit, is when a dad gets home, and they're there physically, but mentally, they aren't there. And I'll be completely honest. There are some times where I get so distracted with my phone, whether that's responding to texts to people in the church or looking up sports scores or whatever it might be, and my kids, you know, are saying, Dad, 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 and it's four or five times before I'm paying attention to them. God, help me. Help me. I need to be intentional because I have so few minutes. I have so few years with my kids. And we as dads need to step it up. Grandparents, a relationship between a grandparent and a grandkid can be one of the most influential relationships on planet earth. You have no idea how many funerals I've been to and someone has said, yeah, my grandma She's the most impactful person in my life. And my, grand, my granddad, I knew he was always praying for me. He's the most influential person in my life. If you're a grandparent, you better step up your game. 
Because your main responsibility, parents, your main responsibility is your kid. God gave you your kid so that you could steward them into the presence of God. Grandparents, you have grandkids not to spoil them rotten, but to lead them to Jesus Christ. What does this look like? Johnny, you competed so well today. You played so well. I was so proud of you. You completed with respect. You were fair. You played with integrity. People could see Jesus in you, and I'm so proud that you're out there representing Jesus. I'm so proud of who you are, buddy. doesn't matter the score. I'm, I'm proud of who you are. You see, you bring it back to Jesus. Let's step it up. People that don't have kids, that don't have grandkids, you're not off the hook. Don't worry. There's someone that God has put in your path intentionally. And it might be the most difficult person in your world right now. Let me ask a very challenging question. This question is not, it's not to bring condemnation. It's not to bring guilt or any form of manipulation. But how much do you have to hate someone to not tell them about Jesus? And how could you ever say that you really love someone, including the people that you love most, your family members, your neighbors? How, how can you really say that you love them unless you are pointing them and bringing them to Christ? Some of you are getting really defensive in your heart right now. You're thinking how manipulative of a pastor I am. You're making up all sorts of excuses as to why you're off the hook. Maybe you hear everything through a legalist lens, but you grew up in a legalist church, and, 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 and so you're calling me a legalist. Hear me. I want everyone here to build people out of a genuine heart. In no way am I trying to, to, to guilt anyone or manipulate anyone, but I wholeheartedly believe that we could all use a renewing of our heart. Each and every single day, we need to ask for a heart transplant. We need to ask God to take our wicked heart and to place in his heart, to open up our eyes and our ears and our thoughts to see and hear and think the things of God. We need his presence and we need his help. In just a moment, I'm going to ask anyone that is responding to come forward and, and we're going to have a moment where we're going to, to pray that God would change our heart. But before we do that as a church family, I, I just want to remind you of the most important thing found in this text in verse 11. And it's this, that Jesus Christ is the firm foundation upon which we build. If we build off of anything else, we are missing the point. And not building on Jesus is easier than you might think. And I would be willing to bet that there are many people that have thought that you've built on Jesus, but you're actually building on a different foundation. Let me explain what I mean. Take the story of Jonah and the big fish. Jonah was a messenger of God who ran away from his calling, which was to preach the gospel to the people of Nineveh. God gave jo uh, Jonah a, a second chance sent a fish to swallow him, deliver him to the people of Nineveh, and in the end, people repented and people were saved, right? Maybe it's been taught that the main point of this story is just to obey God, or to have a heart for lost people, or, or, or how God will give us second chances, and when we screw up or we disobey, God will send another ship, he'll send another way, right? All of those things are true, but that story is just a forerunner of the main story, that many years later, God was going to send another messenger with the same wonderful message. And like Jonah, he would spend three days in complete and total darkness. But this messenger would be God's own son. He would be called the Word because he himself would be God's message. God's message translated into our own language. That everything God wanted to say to the world in a person. Or take the, the, the story of Joseph. Joseph was his father's favorite son. And all of Joseph's brothers invited 
or in, envied him, and they sold him into slavery. And he was wrongfully accused of a crime he did not commit. He was thrown in jail, and eventually he found himself sitting next to the throne of Pharaoh as an appointed prince. Now, some have heard this story as, 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 taught, as if we trust in God through everything, that God will pr- provide for us, and, and he'll see us through it, or, or that God works in mysterious ways, or, or trust in God no matter what, or, or forgive no matter what, as you, you see Joseph forgiving his, his brothers at the end. Again, all of those things are true, but the story of Joseph is just another forerunner of the main story, that one day— God would send another prince, a young prince whose heart would break. And like Joseph, he would leave his home and he would leave his father. And his brothers would hate him and want him dead. He would be sold for pieces of silver. He would be punished even though he had done nothing wrong. But God would use everything that happened to this young prince, even the bad things, to do something good, which was to forgive the world of their sins. Musicians, would you come? You see, in all of our teachings, in all of our life lessons, in all of our sermons, in all of the encouragement we provide, in any building that we do, it needs to revolve around Jesus. And everything needs to revolve around Jesus because if we don't do that, hear me, hear me, church. If we don't do that, then we are building on the foundation of being a better person. Christianity is not about being a better person. That is a side effect of following Christ. The purpose of Christianity is to bring God glory, to bring others into the kingdom. God's heart has been and forever will be for lost people. And he chooses to use me, and he chooses to use you, and he chooses to use his people that are imperfect but are striving to live and attach themselves to Christ to bring others into the family of God. Is that you this morning? Is that you this morning? Nearly every day, my dad would take me to school in in middle school. And nearly every day, I prayed that there wouldn't be a cop on Aurora because nearly every day, we were late to school. And in that four minute drive that was supposed to take six minutes, guess what I got? I got a four minute sermon. And I I couldn't tell you maybe but three or four, maybe five sermons that I heard growing up from my youth pastors, from Pastor Jeff, from Pastor Brian, from my dad. I, I couldn't tell you many of those things, but these little short sermons that my dad would give me every single day, the life handles, things that I could grab onto, that I can take into my adulthood, Those are the things I remember. He'd say, Austin, if someone shows you pornography, you turn away. You run away from that because that will destroy your life. He said, Austin, most people don't know how to be a friend, and so you need to go out and teach them how to be a friend. He said, Austin, hurt people hurt people. And so when someone hurts you at school, that's the person who needs love the most, and you show them that love. He said, Austin, don't let life happen. Make life happen. Don't fall a victim to circumstances. Create the environment that you want to be in and that you want to live in. He taught me so many things that I remember in those moments. Why? Because he was intentional. And I'm calling us as a church that we are very intentional, that we are very strategic in our parenting, And there's people that aren't here. You're like, oh, my kids are adult. They live in a different state. They live out in Washington, wherever it is. Listen, you're not off the hook. There are people here that need spiritual aunts and uncles and spiritual grandfathers and grandmothers. And I'm calling us to become very intentional, to teach our children line upon line, precept upon precept. We need God's help. And we need to make sure that we're not just making good people, but we're making followers of Christ, building on Jesus Christ, our firm foundation. Would you stand with me? I'm calling anyone and everyone who would join me down front to say, Jesus, I need my heart to be continually changed. I I I need you to fill me so that I can fulfill your kingdom here on earth. Allow me to build on no other foundation than the one that's already been 
laid, and that is Jesus Christ. And you're saying here today, Austin, I'm joining you in saying, I want more of God. I need more of his spirit. I need a heart change. I need to do a better job raising my kids, my grandkids, my, my Sunday school class, whatever it is. If that's you and you'd say, Austin, I'm going to come up here. I'm declaring with my own words, with my own heart, would you step out of your seat right now and join me here at this altar saying, I want more of God. It could be the first time that you've responded. It could be the millionth time. This isn't a salvation call. This is saying, I need more of God because I have a responsibility and I need to be filled up. I don't want to be tired in my works. I don't want to produce fake fruit. I want that fruit that flows from the heart that because my heart has been changed by the power of God. And as you come, we're going to spend 60 seconds and we're going to pray. And I want you, those of you that are comfortable praying out loud to pray out loud because I can't pray anything for you. You've got to do it. And if you're not comfortable with praying out loud, then you need to pray under your breath. Or you need to pray in your mind. But don't let this moment pass. Don't let this be a Pastor Austin moment. This needs to be your moment, your personal moment, the time that you declare with your own lips of what you're doing. So let's pray right now all across this room. Jesus, we need your presence, God. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your power, God. Change our hearts. Take the wickedness, take the evil of my heart and replace it with your heart, God. Let me see and hear and feel the things that you see, hear, and feel, God. God, help me in my parenting. Help me in my marriage. Help me in, in the ministry at my workplace, at, in, at the grocery store. Anyone that I come in contact with, God, Fill our hearts and change us. Free us from any sort of obligation, but may it actually flow from a desire that is birthed by you, Jesus Christ. God, I pray across all these people, across mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, Lord, I pray against the spirit of condemnation. Of, of the enemy pointing his finger and saying that you've failed, I pray that you would cover them in a mercy and a grace, knowing that there is mercy and grace in Jesus' name. And I pray that broken homes, broken relationships, broken uh, families, God, that it just start to, to mend and that they would see you working, Lord, and that they would rely on your spirit and your power, God. Bring wholeness to this congregation. Bring one purpose, one mind, one spirit, one body to this congregation. We live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus, I pray, God, as we say those words, Lord, that they would not be someone else's words, but they would be supernaturally our words, that we will do this, not in our own might, not in our own power, but, God, by you entering our lives, by us attaching ourselves to you, for you are the source of life. You are the source of strength. Apart from you, we can bear no fruit. And so this morning, we take a moment and we attach ourselves to you. Every morning, we, we give you the reins of our minds, of our thoughts, of our actions. God, take control for you, our Lord. You are master, beautiful Savior. Help us, Jesus. Help us, God. This morning, I want to leave you with two resources that I have found to be very helpful in my parenting, in my discipleship, just in my understanding, really, of the whole picture of the Bible. And, and these are the two. So if you've got your phone, if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, whatever it is, take a picture of that, write that down. But the Jesus Storybook Bible is incredible. It's a children's Bible. It's $10.81 on Amazon. And I think that any buddy that has a parent or that has a child that's your parent or a grandparent, you should have this Bible in your, your household. Because what it does is it does the same thing about the story with Jonah, the story of Joseph. It takes all of these moral Sunday school stories that we learned and it points them to Jesus. And, and it helps them understand that we're not just trying to be a better person. This all points in it towards Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. The second is the BibleProject.com, and this would be like middle school age and up. And, and these are um, very rich scriptural truths and, and, and concepts, and it gives a holistic approach where you can go through the entire Bible. They have a video for every single book of the Bible, and what it does is it gives you a, a major kind of wide-brushed understanding 
of this is this story, this is this story, this is how it ties in to the rest of all these stories because too long we've learned these stories as segmented stories, David and Goliath and Jonah and all these different things, but they all point to Jesus Christ, every single one of them. And so I want you to utilize these. You need to get, if, if you're like new in your faith, you need to get on thebibleproject.com. They're about six or seven minute videos. They're illustrated as you're watching them. They're very engaging. And I promise light bulbs will start to go, go off. And Christians that you've been in church a long time, you start watching these and you're like, Ah, it's like an epiphany. It's, it's good stuff. And so I want to equip you with that. But most importantly this morning, I want to remind you that Jesus never went around and he preached application. He never said, do this, do this, do this, and do this. What he taught was attachment. Attach yourself to me. Draw close to me. I am the vine, you are the branches, those who remain in me, that abide in me. And so you as a congregation, if we're ever going to see our families, this nation, this city, the state, our district, if we're ever going to see a revival, if we're ever going to see, it's not in anything else besides us individually with each responsibility of an individual here attaching ourselves to Jesus Christ. Would you join me in that? Jesus, I pray a blessing over everyone here this morning. I pray, God, that you would, you would birth in them a desire to do the things that are godly and holy. And as they go their separate ways, may the Spirit of God not just sit in this place and be contained to four walls, but may it go out in this mighty wind, in a rushing wind, where as these people go to lunch, as they go with other family members, as they have other engagements today, that people would experience the presence of God in the walking and talking temple of God, your people, this church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.